Welcome, everybody. I'm James Heimowitz. I'm the president of China Institute, and it's a delight to welcome all of you this evening for what promises to be a fascinating discussion. Um, what's so special about China Institute, I like to think, is that we are both timely and timeless. And I can't think of anything more timely or timeless than Beethoven in China. And tonight's program is brought in conjunction and partnership with the US China Music Institute at the Bard College Conservatory, which gets a lot of their expertise as well with input from the Central Conservatory, Central Conservatory in China. And it's a wonderful partner for us for, for our Music at China Institute program. For those of you who aren't so familiar with China Institute, we've been in, in New York since 1926, helping Americans better understand China through art, through education, through culture, through business practices. And I can't think of a more wonderful way to help Americans have some insight into China than through music. Um, our music at China Institute program features classical instruments, Guqin and Pipa classes, and interesting programs of everything, including Mongolian throat, dance, throat singing, to the one we're about to have this evening. I'm delighted to welcome our guests, and I just wanted to give a quick shout out to our friends at the New York City Department of Cultural Affairs and the New York City Council and Hanban in Beijing for their support of tonight's program. But I know you didn't come to listen to me, so without further ado, I'd like to hand this over to my colleague, Dinda Elliott, who will introduce our guests, Jin Dong and Sheila. Wonderful. Thanks, James. Um, so I'm Dinda Elliott. It is an absolute thrill to have with us today two of the world's great experts on the subject of Beethoven and Western classical music writ large in China. Jin Dong Tsai is the founding director of the US China Music Institute and a professor of music and arts at Bard College. And especially important to us at China Institute, as James just said, Tsai is the artistic director of music at China Institute, Kwame Inyue, which is a partnership between China Institute and the US China Music Institute of the Bard College Conservatory of Music. Tsai recently joined Bard after an illustrious career as a professor and conductor at Stanford University. Sheila Melvin writes about culture in China. She's a regular contributor to the International Herald Tribune and Tsai Xin, and her articles have appeared in many other publications, including the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal. She's the author of three books, The Little Red Book of China Business, Rhapsody in Red, How Western Classical Music Became, Chi Became Chinese, and Beethoven in China, the latter of which were both co-authored with her husband, Jin Dong Tsai. Um, so we're so delighted to have both of you. Thank you for joining us, Jin Dong and Sheila. Um, first, I think before we turn to uh, the sort of history in this conversation, I wanted to just throw out a general question, which is why are we talking about Beethoven in China today? Why is this topic important and relevant? So question for both of you. Well, the world is facing challenges, especially today. We have challenges about the coronavirus. We also have a challenge with the relationship between the US and China. And I think sometimes when you have so many challenges, you need inspiration. And the art and music will produce that. And Beethoven, there's no one else than Beethoven actually can give us that kind of inspiration. That's beautiful, beautiful answer. Anything you wanted to add to that, Sheila? Yeah, I think just we, we talk about Beethoven in China today for Jin Dong's reason, and also because Beethoven has meant so much to so many people in China over so many years. You know, he's inspired reform, rebellion, revolution, revival. He's become woven into the social, political, and cultural fabric that is China today. And when you study the history of Beethoven's introduction and absorption into China, you're really studying China over the past hundred, the past century and more. So it's very important to, to understand what Beethoven means to the Chinese people. Absolutely. When I read, um, just recently read your book, uh, Beethoven in China, written by both of you, you know, I really felt like this is the story of China. You know, it's not just this, it's the story of China as told through music, but it's really 
just a marvelous and wonderful way to look at the history of China. Um, so I know that Jin Dong and Chiu are gonna share some slides with us, some images as they walk through some of the history. But before we do that, Jin Dong, I also feel I must ask you, how and when did you first hear Beethoven? Well, it go, go back to my teenager time. You know, in, during the Cultural Revolution, I grew up in during the Cultural Revolution. And in the middle school, uh, I started to study music. And uh, so that's, uh, you know, uh, I played the violin. I started to learn to play the violin. Of course, the Western music, it's, it's so intriguing to me. And uh, one of the days, uh, my dear friend, Wang Luyan, he is a wonderful painter uh, today. And uh, he just uh, dragged me to his house and showed me there's a, a gramophone machine. You know, you have to wind it to get its power. Then you play the 78 turn, this kind of a hard uh, disc. And uh, so then you know, there's a, it's a wonderful machine. Then he brought up this, uh, it's a thick book. It, it's a record book. You know, there's a one, the many layers of the records. And uh, in the top of that, you know, you can, you can recognize, I said, Beethoven and there's a Beethoven symphonies. So it's, a, it's a really make me heart pumping by the back time. And we have to lower the curtain because we don't want anyone else to hear it. And then we start winding the machine. We put a needle onto the, to the machine, right? And they start to play the Beethoven symphony. I, you know, I didn't know Beethoven that much. So I, even today, I cannot remember if it is a Beethoven fourth symphony or fifth symphony, but it's a very powerful symphony. And I just feel like a, a, a mesmerized by this gigantic song and this complexity, you know, and we learn Chinese music is always one line melody, but here there's a, there's a, like a harmony, there's a counterpoint, and there's like a, a, at the same time, the different layers of music going on. It really just uh, shocked me. And uh, from there on, that's my first encounter with the Beethoven Symphony. And from there on, I want to learn more about this great composer. But you, what year was that and how old were you? That was none, uh, <laughs> I was like uh, in the middle school around 13, 14 years old. Okay. And, and yeah, so that's uh, 19, I would say 1960, 1970. Something. Wow. So you still had to wait a number of years before it was okay to really start studying Beethoven, right? I mean, that's still the middle yeah. of the Yeah, I mean, during the Cultural Revolution, Beethoven or any Western music is forbidden, right? right? But in China, the Western instrument, you're allowed to learn the Western instrument. So okay. lots of people still have to learn those Western instruments through those uh, classic methods. And also, and we may talk about later, you know, even uh, during the Cultural Revolution, when, uh, when Jiang Qing put this uh, model opera, and they forbidden Beethoven, but they put this symphonic music, Sha Jia Wang, pretty much is after Beethoven's image, Beethoven's Symphony Number no. 9. Wow, that's pretty interesting. Okay, so, so I think you're going to be wanting probably in a minute or two to start showing your slides, but I know that Western classical music has such a long history in China, and I wonder if you can share with us when was the music of Beethoven first introduced to China and how was it received? I think uh, Sheila can start that. <laughs> mm -hmm. oh, we don't know the exact first time that Beethoven was played in China, but it was probably in the 1870s in Shanghai because Shanghai had a lot of amateur musical groups uh, in the 1860s and 1870s. And in 1879, what is now the Shanghai Symphony Orchestra was established. And we know they played it uh, before the turn of the 20th century. Um, there were a lot of, you know, there were Germans and they were playing a lot of symphonic music. Um, was, it so all, probably around, was it all Westerners playing in that orchestra? Yes. Yeah. In the early years, the Shanghai Symphony from 1879 to like 1920s was all foreigners and it, it, they were from Manila mostly. And uh, they played for a foreign audience as well. So one of the things we'll talk about is Beethoven was really introduced to China on two different tracks. One was Beethoven the individual and the other was Beethoven the composer. And they kind of came in separately. Oh, really? Okay. So um, I know that Jindo, you want to talk about Li Shutong, right? Who, uh, who really... Yes was such an important figure. So do we want to bring up the slide? Yep. 
Yeah. So, so yeah. Uh, uh, as, uh, as Sheila said, uh, we look at two tracks. One is how Western musicians brought Beethoven to China, and one is how Chinese people uh, brought China, uh, Beethoven to China. So for Chinese side, we want to start, or we uh, uh, the history we can trace it from Li Shutong. And Li Shutong, uh, he when he was a teenager, he went to Japan to study. And there's a political or social change in the turn of the 20th century. And when China becomes so paralleled and, and you know, the, the, and in 1905, they have the abandoned Confucius Institute, uh, Com Confu Confucius uh, exam, sorry, yeah. computer yeah. exam, the national exam. And that's the only exam actually for many young people who want to become a uh, success. So when they abandoned that, they made lots of young people look at the West, look at the, uh, Europe, and look at even the, the, the Chinese neighbor in Japan. And uh, from there on, uh, I think, and we can talk. Uh, Li Shutong is one of those people about uh, really uh, during the uh, early of the 20th century, there are like 13,000 people went to Japan to study. Wow. So a question about Li Shutong. I mean, what do you think he saw in Beethoven in terms of, you know, there was so much change going on in China at that time. It was a time of real intellectual revolution, you could say. Um, what did he see in Beethoven in terms of the relevance that Beethoven might have had to the challenges China was facing in the 20th century? Why was he so excited by yeah. Beethoven? Well, Li Shutong was really looking for role models. You know, he was looking, his ultimate goal was to change China. You know, he was looking for people who could set an example and motivate Chinese people to change. And so he found many different role models in Japan and Beethoven was one of them. And uh -huh. he published a music magazine called The Little Music Magazine. Um, it just had one issue, but the, the first issue had a very short article on Beethoven and he introduced him as someone who would overcome great hardship, who, you know, he never even got married, which in the Confucian tradition was something to suffer. He went deaf when he was a composer, but he triumphed over it all. And he wanted to set that as an example of what China could do as a nation and what Chinese people could do as individuals. Wow. So he was looking for someone who could change social norms in China and be an individual role model to many Chinese. Gosh, and in so doing, or in sort of framing it that way, he was kind of making Beethoven Chinese, right? That's exactly. right. Exactly, looking for a sage. He called him the sage of music. That's wow. right. Wow. So I know that uh, you, you mentioned that another very important character was Xiao Youmei, who I think comes up maybe in the next slide. Um, yeah, uh, the next, um, well, we, oh, let's go back okay. to yeah. the, the different track. Uh, so uh, this is, uh, well, this is still Li Shutong. Li Shutong, yeah. um, what I want to say is, add a little bit more, is when he was in Japan, he just, uh, as he just focused himself. He was in University of Tokyo, an art an art university, Tokyo, Tokyo University of, of Art. So he focused himself on the arts, Western arts especially. You can see there's a couple of pictures on the right. It's his painting, uh, 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 live, uh, you know, drawing. In yeah. the left, actually, he is playing as a female figure in, in, a, in, a, in a plate, in a Western plate. So that's what Li Shutong like, you know, so that's why we can see later, he produces a little uh, music magazine, you know, the Beethoven as, 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 a, as a humanity figure into China. Mm -hmm. And so this is a, what the Chinese people just learned Beethoven. They, they probably never heard Beethoven's music, even uh, I don't know how much himself learned heard Beethoven music. Mm -hmm. But on the other hand, the next slide will say the Shanghai uh, Symphony Orchestra today, yeah. you know, and so the Shanghai uh, Public Band was created in 1879 and was uh, for foreigner and uh, uh, by, uh, played by foreigner and that's the situation. But that orchestra is uh, really continued to grow. In about 1910, you can see this photo. It's one of their, their outdoor concerts in, in, in Shanghai. And then um, we can find that the earliest program they played the Beethoven Symphony is in 1911. So the next slide, you will see this is the original program, copy of the original program. You can see the third item, it said that the, the 
finale from Beethoven Symphony Eroica. So that we can see the earliest Western Symphony Orchestra or uh, orchestra in China played Beethoven Symphony. Uh, so wow. this is uh, the Western train, right? And then we, go, we can go back to Xiaomei. And I think Sheila can tell you more about Xiaomei. Yeah, Xiang Yomei was just another really marvelous intellectual who um, uh, grew up, uh, he heard, I think he lived next to a Portuguese priest who played the organ and he became interested in music. And he also went to Japan to study. And he was sort of torn between a political career and a musical career and he went back and forth. Um, he worked for Sun Yat-sen for a while, but finally he decided mm -hmm. that his true love was music. So he went to Germany to Leipzig and he did a PhD in Chinese, in, in music, in Western music. And then he came back to Beijing and he, uh, tried to establish a music school, sort of a music research institute in, in, in Beijing with the help of Tsai Yuanpei, the great intellectual who was the first president of Peking University. And they, he, they formed a small band there. There you see, Jin Dong can talk about it, that played Beethoven with that many people. Yeah, so this is interesting. You know, how um, can 16, 15 people can play Beethoven? Actually, they did. They played the Beethoven Second Symphony, Third Symphony, Fifth Symphony, Sixth Symphony, movements, not the completed yeah. symphonies. And this orchestra actually from uh, 1922 actually extended until 1927 until um, they, have, they, they were ordered to, to dissolve. And yeah. so, yeah, so this is, you can see there's some wooden instrument players and when, uh, string instrument players and, uh, w and there's a timpani and also there's a parts they, when the orchestra really uh, too, too small people too small amount of people when they cannot cover there's a p Russian pianist on the far left and he will cover all the other parts so this is oh a God. really significant and also Xiaomi wrote many program notes for each concert he, they produced like 50 concerts in Beijing wow. University. And yeah. was this kind of a was this kind of a sensational thing when this happened in 1922? Again, I'm thinking about you know it's right after the May Fourth Movement. It's a time of incredible intellectual um, kind of exploration and a very exciting time intellectually, right? And this is at Peking University with Tsai Ing Pei and all this. Was you know was it well received? Was it shocking? What 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 was you know what were the circumstances when they played? I don't think we, you know, we don't know audience reaction, but we know that, it, as Jin Dong said, he published the programs in all the school newspapers. So he did propagate wow. it. It wasn't just yeah. the people who went to the concerts, but the people, yeah. and he, he did a really good job of playing the music and also showing Beethoven the role model, like for this, the third symphony, which Beethoven had originally dedicated to Napoleon. Uh, he said, oh, if Beethoven knew about China, he definitely would have dedicated this to Sun Yat-sen instead. You know, and he sort of like, he, he did more of the signification job of making Beethoven fit into China's history and culture. So it yeah. definitely inspired a lot of people because, you know, many young musicians heard it and more and more people began studying classical music af yeah. after that. We can't speak yeah. specifically. So fascinating. And and in and in 2015, and I was, uh, I was teaching at uh, uh, Peking University Stanford Center. And so, and I just asked the uh, Peking University student to recreate this kind of a historical event. So we have about the same amount of people uh, we put together, we played the symphony number six. That was, and then, um, you know, we talk about the history of the, the this, this part of the history. It's a, it's a, you can see there's a picture. I just want to throw in here to see, you know, um, today is young people just as curious as willing to, to present Beethoven music. Absolutely. Okay, so yeah. Guys, yeah. So next, uh, uh, this slide, the next, it's an important conductor uh, in Shanghai, the Shanghai Municipal Orchestra. It was the Shanghai Public Band and then changed to Shanghai Municipal Orchestra officially. And by this conductor, he is Italian, um, uh, Mario Pacci, and he came to China just by touring, doing piano, piano concert, and they, they put together an orchestra and because after the First World War, the, the Shanghai uh, Public Band kind of dissolved and not very in good shape. So he reorganized that orchestra. And that orchestra, from he took the baton from 1919 until he left in 1942, really became the best orchestra in the Far East. 
and uh, most of the com uh, most of the players, as she mentioned earlier, are foreigners. Maybe some Filipinos, and mostly and later on, mostly European. Not until late 1930, and mm -hmm. they start to have more Chinese players. Were there? To, were there the I guess there would have been some Chinese in the audience, right? But but mostly foreigners in the audience as well at that time. Yeah, that's what's very one of the many important contributions of Mario Pace is he insisted that the orchestra audience be integrated. Oh. He said that Chinese are musical people, and and he finally he threatened to quit. He said, "I'm not going to conduct here anymore unless the municipal council lets Chinese into the audience." And within a year, it was like 25 percent Chinese. Oh, so that cool. definitely worked. The second great thing he did was in 1927, one of the young Chinese who was listening to the concerts in the audience just came and knocked on his door and said, "I heard that a Dutch musician is on home leave." I'd like to take his place. And they were celebrating the 100th anniversary of Beethoven, or commemorating the 100th anniversary of Beethoven's death. And Pachi said, yes, you can join. So the first Chinese to play in the orchestra played for played Beethoven. They played the fifth and they played the ninth. So it was a very big, so Beethoven sort of intertwined with the history of, of Chinese symphonic music too. Wow, yes. fascinating. Okay, so, so this, this is, the, uh, yeah, this is a, a picture they did of Beethoven 9. They claim this is the world, pre uh, China premiere of Beethoven 9 in China. It's 1936. And uh, you can see the orchestra mostly are foreigners and non-Chinese, but th they engaged uh, uh, Chinese chorus to sing. Yes, uh, yes, 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 okay. Mm -hmm. So that, that would mean then that there was a Chinese chorus that was performing perhaps for Chinese audiences separately most of the time, you know, I guess at that time during the colonial era. They would have just- Yeah, been... I, think, I think, you know, in Shanghai, the, uh, the art scene, especially the music scene was very vibrant. It's a lot of a foreign and Western influence. And there's all different kind of uh, opera houses, courses, and especially after 1930s. And th there are more this kind of activi activ musical activities by foreigner and by Chinese. Right, and choral music was introduced through missionaries, of course, and through missionary schools. And, and that became a very important part of education, particularly after Jin Dong mentioned the abolishment of the Confucian exams in 1905. The foreign run schools became much more important and they all had choruses and many of them had bands. So there were definitely a lot of Chinese choruses by this point. Mm -hmm. so, yeah, so you can see the performance become to really more often you can hear Beethoven and intellectually as well. So next slide we, we introduce this, uh, a great translator and, and intellectual, a Chinese literature, liter, uh, intellectual fully and uh, he and really take a very took important role to exploring music and especially exploring Beethoven to the Chinese readers and Chinese musicians. Right Sheila? Right yeah Fule studied in Paris and it's there he sort of became acquainted with Beethoven through the works of Romain Roland the French author who actually won the Nobel Prize um, and he wrote A Life of Beethoven and he also wrote a book called Jean Christophe, which is a 10 volume novel based on the life of Beethoven that remains so popular in China. To this day, Xi Jinping has mentioned it. He's read it. Really? Many, many people have read that book. And Fule became really enamored of Beethoven through Romain Roland and decided to translate. First, he translated the life of Beethoven into Chinese, and then he translated Jean Christophe. And his purpose, this was in the 1930s, was to encourage the Chinese people in time of war with the Japanese invading and everyone suffering. He said, you need to find strength through Beethoven, you know, out of struggle and suffering comes joy and no one can teach us that better than Beethoven. So this was sort of his contribution to the war effort. So again, can we pause on that for a second? Um, it sounds, again, back to that idea of China's incredible ability to absorb outside things and kind of you know, make them Chinese. Um, I guess Beethoven was really transformed into a kind of a Chinese hero, right? Right, I mean, Beethoven belongs to everybody and everyone has their own experience and history of Beethoven, but he's absolutely as much a Chinese figure as he's a German one or American one or a European one or anything, yes. So it's really, and it's about overcoming adversity and at that time, at a time of war, it was kind of, this is what China needs to do. Exactly. Yeah. Wow. You know, and we grow up always, uh, we say we have to uh, eat the bitter, we have to go through uh, a hardship and before you can triumph. And then fate often, it's a perfect figure of that. 
you know, he went through turmoils, he went through bad relationships, he went through so many obstacles. And, you know, he, can't, he lost his hearing and all those. So, so when people learn from that, then really they appreciate how Beethoven in the end produced this incredible music. Hmm. So I think the next one, the next slide we have is this incredible performance. Yes, 1959. Okay, talk about this amazing 1959. They performed Beethoven's Ninth. Yeah, I how think. On earth, uh, how on earth did that happen? <laughs> I think Fule is a trend. Tran also, it's a trans. Trans. Uh, what do you call the middle kind of a bridge or? person? Yeah, the bridge person, and he translated Beethoven's life in 1930s. But then he started translating John Christoph, but didn't finish until 19 early 1950s. And it's a uh, so 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 the the book after 1949 when the People's Republic of China established actually the. Uh, the John Christoph, it, like Sheila said, it really influenced the, you know, few gen generations of young people, and including myself. And like uh, last year, when I went back to home to look at my old books, I found this uh, a John Christoph Chinese version. I open it, I see every, you know, like underline I'm I'm I marked, and the sentences I, I just, just feel so in, inspired. And it just you know when I was really young when when I read that. And then um, in the first, I will say, more than uh, 10 years from 1949 until early 1960, uh, China is really, uh, it tried to build up everything. And that's including arts and culture. And so, the, uh, so 1959 is the year of the 10th anniversary of the People's Republic. They want to have a big celebration of years Obviously, they picked Beethoven Symphony Number no. Nine to perform, and there are more. Also, uh, I think Sheila can tell you more as other uh, relationship with the Soviet Union back then. If you know, also affected this performance. So before right. we yeah, go ahead, Sheila, and then I have a question for you. But go ahead. I was just going to say that those who know the history of this period, you know, 1949 to 1959 was a fairly tumultuous time. There were lots of different political movements. And in the classical musical world, there were big arguments as to whether classical music was too bourgeois and was not something that communist China should have, or was classical music something that could serve the workers, peasants, and soldiers. And so there was this constant debate. The Russian presence or the Soviet presence helped to protect classical music because, of course, Lenin loved Beethoven and they had lots of classical music in the Soviet Union. So this is a really big occasion. You know, these musicians actually, they came back from the countryside where they'd been sent for the Great Leap Forward and they were all brought back to, to, so they could do a Beethoven study month. And they all studied Beethoven so hard and they were able to perform it for the 10th anniversary. And there was this, they did the ninth in Chinese. There was lots of other Beethoven concerts and Mao Zedong himself, he didn't attend this, but he did attend a performance of, of, of Beethoven's Egmont Overture. So there was Beethoven played basically all year long, and this is sort of the high mark. I'm so fascinated to to learn about this because, you know, we all know that in 19, as early as 1942, Mao in Yan'an laid out his kind of philosophy that art must serve the people, right? And that was sort of, you know, there's been this struggle in China among artists and musicians ever since then, uh, in terms of, you know, what is the role of art, what is the role of music. So I'm fascinated that this music was, it did continue to be, despite the fact that you said there was this continuing sort of debate about whether Beethoven was bourgeois or was he a hero, um, but that it did manage to, I'm kind of wondering where was Mao in all of this, you know? I don't think Mao was directly involved, but the big thing is Beethoven was also a revolutionary. Yes. So that's how people could frame him. They said Beethoven was a revolutionary. And in the Soviet Union, they said, you know, the Soviet Union was his second motherland. And Beethoven really preferred the Russian pronunciation of his name. And you had all these East German advisors going to China, East German conductors, yeah. East German musicians. So they all promoted Beethoven. So that really is what helped uh, protect and promote Beethoven in China during this period. And, and Mao's talk in 1942 also, you know, has been influenced on Chinese arts and culture, that's for sure. And, but also he said, we need to bring everything in, foreign tradition and everything in mighty to the pod and to serve the politics, to okay. serve the majority of the people, which is the workers, peasants, and soldiers. Yeah, right. Okay, I think we have on the next 
slide. Here we go. Make sure you put the volume up. Whoops, we can't hear it. Aaron, we can't hear it. Aaron, can you start? It's just amazing to think of these people having just come back from the Great Leap Forward, back from the countryside, and basically study, 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 and perform. Amazing. Yeah, they, they studied really hard, and uh, like a divided days in different sessions, and they play by quartet, play by sectionals, and they was coached by uh, East German uh, coaches, and then in the end, they put together. It was uh, one of the really very historical events. Wow. And, and Jin Dong, I remember, I remember you said, Jin Dong, that there was a debate about what to call God. Yeah, there was a debate, the translation of the last woman of the Odi to Joy, right? The, the words. And when they say the God is on, in, the, in the watching, and, and somehow the, the, they were debating. To, so they, and the early version, they, they translate all the word God into heaven because, you know, and the communists, uh, you don't believe in God. And, and they translate to heaven to avoid the, 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 the political conflicts. And, right. But I think in the end, they actually allowed uh, to use God, the word of God. Okay, interesting. Yeah. So now, of course, we see this photograph and we know that, you know, there was a terrible, the musicians um, suffered unbelievably during the Cultural Revolution. So tell us a little bit about what, what happened. Well, basically, as I said, 1959 was kind of a high mark, and by 1963, there was a small campaign to criticize the, the music of WC because it was impressionist and it didn't reflect the real lives of the people. And from then on, you really didn't hear much uh, classical music from the West at all. The Cultural Revolution started in 1966, and the, you know, one of the big slogans was to destroy the old and to build the new. And the old included old culture, old customs, old thinking, old ideas, and classical music kind of fit into all of that, you know, and it was foreign to boot. So there was tremendous criticism of Western classical music and of Chinese traditional music. And the people who played it or composed it or ran the conservatories were attacked by, by groups of red guards like, like you see in this, in this picture here. So it was a really a terrible time for classical musicians. And just to give one example, at the Shanghai Conservatory, 17 professors committed suicide, sometimes with their families, because they were just so viciously attacked, oftentimes by their own students. It was, it was a really terrible period, especially the first two years. At that time, were there conservatories all over the country in major cities, or uh, was it really just Shanghai and Beijing, or? There were officially seven conservatories okay. and Beijing and Beijing and Shanghai and uh, Wuhan or Guangzhou and some of those, those major cities. And, but I think the Shanghai uh, Conservatory has the longest history and also the Central Conservatory of Beijing has the best faculty. And so those uh, two conservatories suffer the most, especially the Shanghai Conservatory, you know, and so, so the musicians came back to China uh, in uh, like uh, after 1949, want to serve the new China. And then now being accused of as a traitor or a foreign agents, and uh, some, some, there's no reason, you know, there's a very wonderful pianist. She just liked to wear Western style clothes, wear high heels. Then she was just, uh, uh, you know, punished and then she committed suicide. It's just like, a, it's a really, it's a turmoil. It's a right. very bad time. And what happened to Fu Lin? Yeah, so the next Fule, photo sorry. you can see, this is a, a Fu Lei and, and his wife and uh, they actually uh, commit suicide. Mm -hmm. Sheila and Yeah, it's just one of those, you know, horrible stories where they started, you know, they were criticized by Red Guards by their own students and um, they ransacked the house and couldn't find any incriminating evidence. But finally they found an old trunk in the attic 
and in the trunk in the attic was an old mirror and on the old mirror was a backing of a newspaper and the newspaper had a picture of John Kaishak. And they said, okay, this is proof that, you know, you support John Kaishak, you're a foreign agent. And so then they started viciously attacking, the, the mob started viciously attacking them. And, and one night, Fule just, he wrote a note, he left money for his housekeeper, library books to be returned, and then they both hung themselves in their bedroom. Hmm. Hmm. What really has happened to, like, what, what his family now, does, did they have children? And what's happened to their children since? Did they, they had two wonderful children, uh, Fouton, uh, Fouton and Fumin, right? And Fumin, I think, was a professor of French literature, but Fouton became a globally renowned pianist, and he's still performing to this day. Yeah. So um, he, happened, he was in Europe. He'd won the, a prize in the Chopin competition. He was really, really, really a renowned pianist, raised to be won by Foule, who, of course, loved music so much. And so he survived and, and is, is, plays piano to this day. Oh, my God, that's so wonderful. So their spirit kind of lives on through their children. Yes, and also Foulet wrote his son many, many letters. And after the Cultural Revolution added, ended, these letters were compiled into a book that sold millions of copies. It was about how to be first a man, then a, then a, then a father, then an artist, then a musician. It was just all these things on how to live a cultured life that he wrote to his son. And it influenced many generations of artists, including my husband, who also has that book on a shelf, very well underlined. <laughs> <laughs> right. Oh, how amazing. Yeah, then another character, another very important person, you know, suffered during the Cultural Revolution, the Lu Hongwen is conductor. And it's the, uh, it's, every time when I mention his story, it's, I become so emotional. And it's, uh, you know, he's Catholic, he's a well-trained conductor, and he uh, just devoured himself to 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 do classical music, and uh, during the Cultural Revolution, he started to to suffer. Mm -hmm. And she uh, would, I think. Right, you can take and in addition to those things, Jin Dong said he was uh, very stubborn, strong-willed, outspoken. Um, you know, he stuck to his own values. And when it came time to criticize classical music and criticize his professors and criticize Beethoven, he refused to do it. And he just said, you know, if we want to criticize someone, let's criticize that witch, Jiang Qing. I mean, he said that in public. He said things that you would just never say. And he said, why are you telling, um, you know, instead of having the peasants and soldiers and people in China should be learning from Beethoven, not criticizing Beethoven. And he said all these things. He just, he would just wouldn't, he always spoke his mind. And eventually he got actually arrested, not just struggled against in the street, but actually arrested, brought into the detention system. He became prisoner. I think it was 1144. He was locked up and he was still expected to participate in these sessions to criticize his professors and, and composers and Beethoven. He said, I'm not going to do it. And so uh, one day he said something uh, really, really terrible about an obscure political movement, but it got him in great trouble. And they said, well, do you want to live or do you want to die? And he said, I really want to live, but not if it's like this, because the Cultural Revolution is killing everything that is wonderful about living. And if, if I have to go on like this, I'd rather be dead. And so then they said, okay, we're sentencing you to death. And on the way to his execution, he had a cellmate named Liu Wenzhong. And he told his cellmate, if you ever get out of here alive, please do one thing, two things for me. One is find my son and tell him what happened to me because his son had been sent to Xinjiang. And the second is go to Austria, go to Vienna and to the tomb of Beethoven and lay a bouquet of flowers on his grave and tell him that his Chinese disciple went to his execution humming the Misa Solemnis, which oh, was his favorite piece of music. And he did actually go to his execution humming the Misa Solemnis. And years later, Liu Wenzhong went to Vienna and laid a bouquet of flowers on Beethoven. Oh, that's so beautiful. So this is the newspaper article announcing his, um, his death, right? Yes. Execution. This oh. is the next day, uh, the Shanghai newspaper announced that there's a seven, uh, a group of seven uh, called counter revolutionists, uh, you know, uh, sent to death. And uh, it, it's a, it, and you, in the, during the Cultural Revolution, those kind of event, it's a public event. It's almost like a 10,000 people to be, to be their witness. And it's just uh, unthinkable even for, for today, say how that can happen, how that many people can just following this, uh, this, this, this turmoil. And yeah. when they execute him, before they execute and 
of him, they also cut his throat because they don't want me, those people to yell out um, things. It's just a very cool crew. Yeah, yeah, cut their vocal cords, yeah. That's right, yeah. So then we have the end of the Cultural Revolution, at, or the beginning of the end. I guess this is sort of to the tail end of the Cultural Revolution and this incredibly historic visit by Nixon. I think, yeah, I think, you know, and the, the end of the Cultural Revolution, I think it more realized that they, we need, he need a new outlet. And so and one of them, he reached out to America. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So look at the next slide. So Nixon uh, visited China in 1972, and then one of the first uh, uh, cultural exchange uh, activities uh, was 1973, in 1973, the Philadelphia Orchestra with the historical tour to China. Mm -hmm. So that, you know, we, uh, uh, we actually, uh, it's, a, it's a lot of story to talk about that and about the Beethoven symphonies played and so on. It's, a, it's, a, it's also a wonderful part of it. So I want That's you all good. to uh, tune in next Tuesday night um, to another wonderful music program uh, with featuring, also feature, featuring Tsai Jin Dong and um, ambassador, former ambassador Nick Platt um, and the producers of a wonderful new documentary that's going to appear on PBS that's about the journey of the Philadelphia Orchestra's um, exchanges in China. And it's going to be a great program. We're going to show a clip from the film and then talk about the actual uh, story of Eugene Ormandy and the orchestra uh, coming to China. Yes, uh, I think it's a, good, it's, it's a wonderful film and we try to uh, follow the journey of uh, Philadelphia Orchestra in China to see how this uh, cultural exchange take an important role in the relationship, but also to see how that nurtured uh, Chinese classical music be become powerhouse today. What I'm curious about, just looking at that photograph, and we could talk about it more next week, but, but you know, these are Chinese musicians he's conducting. Um, they've been basically, you know, cleaning toilets and working in the countryside for, you know, at least it's 73, so for at least, you know, seven years. Um, somehow they managed to keep up or keep playing instruments or, you know, it's, it's hard to imagine how they could have come back like this, but I guess, they must have studied like crazy when they came back, came back into town. Well, actually, the, the Shanghai Symphony and the, and the Central Orchestra in Beijing, they managed to stay alive during all this period by adapting the model operas to symphonic oh music. Oh, my gosh. So that's, they had, you know, that, that was their way to survive. So they wow. created symphonic versions of several of the model operas. So that's, and of course, all the model operas had Western musical instruments in them because Jiang Qing, Madame Mao believed that they were more powerful and they inspired people to heroism better than Chinese instruments. So lots of people actually learned how to play Western musical instruments during the Cultural Revolution, even though they didn't play Western music on them. And that's one of the big reasons when the Cultural Revolution finally ended, that you had so many people interested in Western music because they were already exposed to violins and cellos oh and they God. played. So that's what really happened. So. But what you say is also correct because they hadn't played any Beethoven. So it was a very big deal for them to actually get to play Beethoven. They hadn't been able to play it in, in, in 10 years. So yeah. that was a big deal here, but they were still performing um, as musicians. Yeah, yeah. So let's talk a little bit now about that, um, you know, from 1973 to today, uh, you know, the sort of return of Western uh, classical music to China and now you know, one, I was reading that one commentator said that China today has a, quote, Beethoven complex, uh, because I guess, you know, it's so popular that it's, uh, you know, now called the Beethoven complex. So what, talk a little bit about what's happened in the last 20, 30 years uh, in terms of Western classical music in China, and why did it become so popular? Uh, well, one of the reasons is what I just said. When the Cultural Revolution ended, there was this huge interest for people who hadn't been able to hear it for years, yeah. but who had been exposed to the, the instruments. And so they went out to, and they reopened the conservatories and people flooded in trying to study. In 1978, 79, there was Beethoven fever when like the Shanghai Symphony regrouped and it played all nine Beethoven symphonies and everyone lined up at three in the morning to get tickets. 
so there was just this great interest. And again, because Beethoven had already been known in China for so many years and so many different positions, really, you know, to inspire so many different goals, people just wanted to hear Beethoven again. And mm. classical music, you know, they, classical music sort of struggled in the 80s and the 90s because the, you know, the organizations didn't have money. It's really expensive to run an orchestra in an opera, but they slowly rebuilt and regrouped. And then after 2000, kind of like after China joined the WTO, it just took off because the Chinese government really believes that culture, you know, Mao said it, Yenan, we need a cultural army. And, and the, the newest translation of that idea is, is to be a great country, we have to have a great culture. But again, because China absorbs various different cultures from the outside world, they said, we want to, you know, we have to have a great culture, but it can incorporate aspects of foreign culture. So every city started building a beautiful opera house, symphony hall, developing its own orchestras and operas. And so it's really just been booming um, for the last 20 years. Mm -hmm. And it seems yeah. like, um, you know, every family that's kind of aspiring to, you know, build a new and better life, they want to make sure that their son or daughter studies piano starting at age four or something like that. Look, it seems like, you know, or study violin, right? I mean, yes, you know, music has been a very important part of the Chinese education. Long time ago, you can go back to Confucius, you know, it's a, one of the elements. It's a very, very important for back then was uh, literary, uh, but it's uh, emerged into education. And so, so then now in the modern time, and we import this Western music, but actually it's a Western music also gave Ch Chinese people this kind of a see it's a very high level art and, and it can show your status and also can give your children a discipline you have to practice every day to be good. So all those elements put together so to make the, 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 the you know, the, a classical music form, it's a Western instrument, this art form becomes so perfect root in the Chinese community. And so, and then you can see today, you know, there's a, a concert hall, opera houses, but also China every year produce 70% of the piano made in the world. And I think more than 80% of string instruments are around the world. And with that, there are millions, millions of young people are learning to play the Western instrument and to learn the classical music. And we've seen that many, excuse me, I've got a mosquito flying around, but you see that many, um, many, uh, you know, musical superstars around the world come from China these days. Um, yes. And I wonder if, you know, does the sense of Chinese emphasis on education and also discipline with children, do you think that that, I mean, do you think China's creating the, you know, creating and, and nurturing and developing the best musicians in the world? <laughs> and I, I, I think you know you can see a different a different ways of of this. And in the past, all the Chinese parents, you know, each par each family, you only have one child, so they want to put everything into the child. And mm -hmm. also, they see the success of Long Long, success of Li Yunli, and the yeah. superstars, the artists, and musicians. So they want their own kids to be superstars. And so that's the one uh, thing they want to follow to, to, to push their kids to learn classical music. But also definitely, you, as you said, as I said, the discipline, you know, the, the, the learning of music actually can help the kids to grow, to be a better person, to be a more around person. And you also can get credits for getting to uh, important high schools, middle schools or college. So all those uh, triggered people just want to get into classical music. So I want to encourage people. I, I think let's, let's take some questions from the audience, shall we? Um, I want to encourage people, anybody who has a question, you can ask your question either by going to the chat box or you can go to the Q&A question and um, the Q&A box and uh, you know, type, type a question if you have one. Um, just trying to see. Um, you can also, if you go on to participants, you can raise your hand, um, you know, by, by hitting the raise your hand button. Um, but in the meantime, you know, we'll talk about this a lot, I think, next week as well. But I guess, the, you know, it's so fascinating to see that, um, you know, 
classical music is on the decline in the States, I'm sorry to say, but I, my understanding is that audiences are getting older and older and older and audiences are dwindling. Um, but even as, at a time when you see really the audiences to keep growing in China, right? Is China going to be ultimately the kind of savior for classical music? And then, you know, what's so funny is then the idea is that something that originally really was Western becomes, truly becomes Chinese. Full circle. Yes. Yeah. yeah. I mean, people have been asking the question, you know, is China going to save uh, classical music for a long time? And Jin Dong and I would usually with counter and say, that's not the best question. The question is, how's it going to change it? You know, because in order for classical music to remain dynamic, China ha it should be contributing to it, which it is. It's not just going to preserve old Western symphonies and perform them, it's going to create its own great new symphonies, which the many wonderful Chinese composers are doing and promote them out into the world stage. Right now with coronavirus and the shutdown of, you know, all the orchestras and operas in our country, it, it, you know, it does look like, you know, music's already being performed in China again. They're already back in the concert halls. They have great government support for artists and for the halls. So um, it's hard to say. You know, there's great, wonderful musicians and wonderful audiences the world over, but is China going to become even more important because of this period? I would say yes. Yeah, the classical music is a very, we can say it's an ancient form now, right? It's a few hundred years old. And we're in the already two decades into 21st century. I think all the musicians and the society is looking for what going to be next for the mm -hmm. classical music. Mm -hmm. uh, Besides, we're playing Mahler, Beethoven, and those uh, those uh, great treasures. We need to have the music of our time. And what is the music of our time? And that is the big question we are all asking, but also we are all trying. So that's what I see in this generation, new generation of Chinese composers. They came to to, to up front and many of them actually really it's the uh, some of the major uh, composers in the contemporary uh, contemporary music and we hope the, this new generation and they can add more energy to the classical music and to just join force with the world uh, great artists and compose together to create new new music Wonderful. I see we've got a number of questions that people have typed, which I'll come to in a second, but I'm delighted to see that Ambassador Nick Nicholas Platt has raised his hand. Uh, so Aaron, I'm so thrilled he's in the audience. Aaron, can you unmute Ambassador Platt so he can ask his question? Go ahead, uh, uh, Ambassador. I'm unmuted now. Can you hear me? We sure can. Good. Well, listen, um, this has been a wonderful program because it fills in a lot of gaps in our knowledge of the traditions for classical music in, in China. I've been involved in this, in this uh, activity really since 1973, but I have, um, I wanted to ask, say that the, I, I really do think that there is a huge interest in, in, in classical music in China. The Philadelphia Orchestra, you know, went in 73, then they they didn't go again until 93. And mm -hmm. then in 2011, I was involved in a program to completely update their activities. And this involved um, the orchestra going to China, full orchestra for several years in a row. But the most important thing about it was that the orchestra would take a lot of time in each city where it played uh, to do training. And what the, what the Chinese wanted was, first of all, to get their orchestras up to speed because they wanted, in line with the trends that you've described, they wanted, they saw, they saw music as soft power and, and uh, they wanted their orchestras to get good enough so that they could tour internationally. And the mm -hmm. orchestra, Philadelphia Orchestra said, fine, we'll help with all of that. And we'll also give you the kind of contacts that you need in order to tour internationally. And this has been happening. And um, uh, so anyway, this is a little teaser for next week. 
but uh, it's 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 amazing to see when you go to concerts here, all the all the hair is white. Hmm. Yeah. If you go to concerts in in China, uh, it, the people are all families are middle aged with young kids, all all attending. I mean, I don't know how many millions of Chinese kids take music lessons. And China has become much more prosperous and so people can afford to go to concerts by the Philadelphia Orchestra, people like that. So it's a very lively scene. Now, I was there, by the way, when or Ormandy conducted Li De Lun, Li De Lun's orchestra in 73. And you asked, you know, how did they really figure this out? Well, they weren't as rusty as, as, as mm -hmm. we, we, we thought. And, but the thing that was so striking was the difference between the orchestra's performance under Lili Lun and under Ormandy. And the, 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 the orchestra members that I know I'm talking about the Chinese. They said, well, we just looked at him and we followed what he wanted us to do. And I have to say, being not being a, a musician, professional musician myself, but the, the, the difference in the sound and the quality was totally noticeable. Anyway. Amazing. It's Amazing. A, yes. it's a, it's a great that's what I see. Yeah, that's what I see today. There's so much we can do. We can help. Chi we can help them, and uh, to you know, we can help each other. And so, the Chinese, the Chinese wanted to want want their music to be to be heard abroad, and so the Philadelphia people have been helping with that, and uh, they want to adjust the, how would I say, the orchestration of traditional Chinese music to Western, to Western uh, instruments because they it projects better. But anyway, it's a great study. It's a, I've spent a lot of my life on this and I really, I really love this topic. And uh, it's, a, it's a real growth industry and in fact, the cultural and particularly musical exchange is still very much a going concern, even though the rest of our relationship is not in a very good state. Ambassador, thank you so much for sharing that with us. We're so thrilled you're here. And again, I will really, really urge people to join us next week because, um, you know, not only Will you hear more from Jin Dong next week, but also the ambassador features in the film. He's fabulous, he's brilliant. You'll hear more from him. So, but you know, picking up on one of the things that Ambassador Platt just said, Jin Dong, he was talking about the Chinese orchestra's uh, interest in also having Chinese music come to the world. And I wonder if you, just for a moment, we have a few more questions from the, you know, from the audience about Beethoven. We'll come to that in a sec, but I wonder if you will share with us what I think is such a brilliant concept behind your U.S. China Music Institute at Bard and what you're trying to do with that, the idea of bringing Chinese music to the world. Yes, I think it's, it's a really a wonderful time, you know, and in the past three, I would say three or four decades and the two sides of the musicians and interact with each other and uh, you can go to any American opera house, a symphony orchestra, conservatory, and they are Chinese musicians. And so that's what I see, um, you know, and as I mentioned earlier, the 21st century, what we're looking for, how we can find the, the music of our time. So that's how, why the Bard College actually uh, very encouraged Jing to create this U.S. China Music Institute. We can learn from each other 
and uh, we brought some Chinese instruments into the Western conservatories. People can become uh, Arhu or Pipa majors in the conservatories, but also we premiere new works in Carnegie Hall and, uh, and, uh, and the Lincoln Center, so on. And on the other side, we also implement uh, like arts education and the jazz studies or musical studies in the West in, in, in China. So I think those are, those are exchange we that we, we at least we, what we can do to help uh, to to make uh, the music uh, uh, on both sides much better. Such great programs. So I don't see any other raised hands, but I'm I'm gonna read a couple of questions from the audience, and if you don't mind, we'll keep going for maybe another ten minutes or so. We're we're around eight o'clock now, but are you okay for another ten minutes? Of course. Okay, what a treat for us. Okay, great. So I've got a question from Wendy Farris, who is asking, what's the influence of Beethoven's style on Chinese composers? And what is that in terms of, are there any particular stylistic features? That's a very interesting question. You know, in the West, we play Beethoven, we play any composer, actually a much, a very important part is how you interpret the particular composer or the particular piece. And in China, in the early time, I don't think they get that level yet, right? We, first of all, we need to hear the Beethoven. We need to hear it Beethoven being played mm -hmm. by the small orchestra or, or large orchestra in general. But uh, gradually, they start to, to, to look at more about how do we play Beethoven? And what is different between Eugene Ormandy conducted Beethoven and the Chinese conductor Li Dolun conducted Beethoven. So that's, it, it's taken a long time uh, for Chinese people to continue to explore. And because the, in the end, the Western music is a foreign thing to China. And, but in the, you know, the Chinese conservatories had very wonderful programs. And also in the past three decades, I would say, there's so many uh, Chinese musicians came out broad to learn classical music in Western conservatories. And which means that they teach a lot about the stylistic things and the, the, the particular cultural or society or history that kind of elements into the classical music. So now I would say um, the Chinese musicians play Beethoven, it's gradually elevated to a more uh, uh, thoughtful or interpretive mm -hmm. and uh, more profound level. Interesting. Um, I have another question from Marilyn Gleistein, who is, I'll shorten it a bit, but basically she's asking, in this sort of craze for Western music, and this is picking up a little bit on what you're trying to do at Bard, uh, in this craze for Western music in China, uh, you know, is there a concern that somehow traditional Chinese instruments will get lost in the shuffle, that, you know, Chinese traditional music just gets kind of ignored. Well, I think our focus, of course, has been on Beethoven and Western <laughs> music, but absolutely, there's still, you know, there's lots of people out there learning Guzheng and Guqin and Pipa and all that too, because this, this ties into, you know, the Chinese, we mentioned self-discipline and, um, and accomplishment, but this whole concept of self-cultivation. Chinese people want to study music because it's, it's a very rich tradition of self-cultivation. And so they're still studying traditional instruments. There's traditional orchestras that were modeled after the Western Symphony, and they play in a big ensemble, just like a Western Symphony. And also you have all these wonderful uh, concertos where you have the Western Symphony Orchestra with a pipa or with an arhu or with, with different traditional Chinese instruments because you have these amazing world-class, you know, Tandu and Zholong, Chen Yi, Ye Xiaogang. There's so many composers. Huangzi, there's a lot in New York too, who, um, who, who write for Chinese instruments and Western orchestra together. So what you really have is, is a combination. And there is more and more of that. And also it's very important, it's becoming much more performed in China. Originally, I think like up until about 2000 or so, Chinese people just wanted to hear the Western music, but now they're very interested in, as Jin Dong put it, the music of our time and our country. Yeah, and also, you know, and Chinese, uh, Chinese music, just like Chinese culture, it's like a big melting pot. They absorb all different kind of things and then make them to Chinese. And even in the 1920s, 1930s, there's a very famous Arhu player uh, actually adopting violin technique into arhu play and in today's conservatories actually you can on one hand you see this thailand violin players the piano players and just unbelievable but also you can see just same talented 
uh, Arhu player and Pipa players and uh, on the other side. So, so those are, you can see the Western and Chinese music it, uh, in the conservatory, they combine together and learn from each other. And that's, I think it's, a, it's what we're trying to do, you know, for the US China Music Institute. If we have a Chinese musician or Chinese instrument implemented in the Western conservatory uh, curriculum or major studies, in, they it made them to have to collaborate. And when they collaborate together, then the new music will come out. Right, and that also gives us the gift because right now Chinese composers have the advantage that they have their feet in both these rich traditions and they can draw on both of them equally. And so when you have programs like the, the US China Music Institute at Bard or like what you guys are doing in New York, it, it enables Americans to start having access to China's own rich traditions. And that, that enriches our culture and our lives too and our music. Right. So it's really even even talk of the classical music, you know, the, during during Haydn's time, the, the orchestra had no clarinet, no, uh, you know, there are a lot of instruments we don't have. So when Beethoven and he add trombone into the orchestra, and later on Mahler, you add a bass clarinet, you add the saxophone, you add all those kind of instruments to enrich this orchestra uh, meeting. And I think that's what it's, you can see. It's it's a it's a progress. So I've got two questions as our final questions. I'm going to combine them, um, but they're really, both of them are kind of picking up on exactly what you're talking about now and just, just you know, pushing a little bit further. One question from Jennifer Lin, um, who asks, she says, the New York Times recently ran a story about the new Cold War between the U.S. and China. Do you think that will affect cultural exchanges between orchestras in China and the U.S.? So that's the first question, is just what, what impact will all these troubles have on cultural exchanges? The second question, very much related, is from Xu Chuan Li, who says that you said the story of Beethoven could offer an inspiration to solve today's problems. I'm curious how music could help deal with problems, such as the tensions between the US and China. So I guess the first is, you know, how is this, how are these um, tensions affecting collaborations and cultural exchange? And do you think that music can help overcome the difficulties? Yeah, and let me say first, and then Sheila can uh, put it and put it in. I think uh, it's uh, very intense, very uh, unfortunate way at the China and the US relationship. Uh, it's going to the, this, what it has been developed. But because of that, I think cultural uh, exchange become more important. For example, and um, it's for the for the uh, our U.S. China Music Institute, we implemented uh, the Chinese instrument major in the Western Conservatory. Uh, the, our initial thinking is, you know, in the beginning years, maybe just only Chinese people play the instrument will come to bar to study. But even that. They, uh, on one hand, they study traditional Chinese music, but on the other hand, they learn the American liberal arts education. So when they grow up, and when they graduate from the college, they will become a, as an open-minded person to know both cultural. And so they can, I think that they will take a very important role in strengthening this, uh, this uh, relationship. And we need to see further uh, than just uh, you know, in the current uh, the crisis. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah, I would just add to that. I, I, I don't think it has affected the desire to collaborate at all. It, if anything, it makes it even stronger. But certainly the current circumstances have affected the ability. And some of the circumstances are political and some just have to do with, you know, the, the pandemic. Um, but what I see is people's desire is, is, is even stronger. And everyone who's on this video, everyone who's listening here, it's our obligation to try to make sure that that does not happen. And that these we don't need to go back to the 80s. We don't need to go back to the future. We need to keep all of this stuff going strong. It's, it's, it's critical. Yeah, it's a, a, a mental talk of Beethoven, right? Beethoven in his Ninth Symphony, and one of the main theme is that all the people become brothers. Right. And so that is a very important humanity message. We have been learning from Beethoven through all those years. And still, every time we hear the Beethoven Symphony, we hear the Beethoven Symphony number no. nine, we always get excited. We always uh, have more hope than 
than what what we have to counter in the you know in the current that's a brilliant brilliant way to close the program i want to thank you i mean we've heard about we've learned about history we've learned about struggle we've learned about overcoming adversary adversity through beethoven and the chinese looking to beethoven as an example and uh, this has been so inspiring, particularly your comments about Beethoven's Ninth and people becoming brothers. So um, here's to cultural exchange and thank you so much for joining us. I wanna urge everybody to please join us again next Thursday, next Tuesday, Tuesday evening uh, for another wonderful conversation. Go ahead, Jin Dong. Did yeah, you we'll, send, we'll send the, the, the clip to them, right? Yes, we will. We will send the um, clip to the, you know, the piece of the film to people who are attending next week, and we will also show the clip during the program. So we look forward to seeing you again next week. Um, Jin Dong and Sheila, you're brilliant. Ambassador Platt, thank you for joining us, and it's just been such a thrill. Thank you. Thank you, Dinda. Thanks so much. Thank you, Dinda. Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye.